Mary had a little cat. She used to call it Daniel. Then she found it just six months, and now she calls it Manuel. Mary had a little cat. She used to call it Manuel has been received into Scottish folklore as a figure of um, horror, revulsion and fear. What on earth made him kill all those people? The business of having the power of life for death over, over living creatures. Was had a super ego, looked upon us as lesser beings, really. So you're dealing with the, with the works of a madman. And there's no, no rhyme or reason to the way he behaved. He, he, there didn't seem to be any pattern to his killing. He was a monster. There's no two ways about it. He was a monster. He is a paradigm psychopath. He is not from another planet. He is not an alien. He is a psychopath. On the 11th of July, 1958, Peter Manuel was hanged in Barlini Prison, Glasgow, at the age of 31. Buried in an unmarked grave, Manuel stood trial for seven murders, although he later said he killed more. Glasgow and its surrounding areas lived in fear when he was at large. What drove Peter Manuel to kill? As the rest of Scotland saw in the new year of 1958, Peter Manuel was on a killing spree. He murdered Peter and Doris Smart and their ten-year-old son Michael as they lay in their beds. They were his last victims. The murders had no apparent motive and Peter Manuel's murderous rampage has no comparison in modern Scottish history. People were being shot in their beds. I mean, this is the, the key issue, is when you go to bed at night, you think to yourself, well, this should be a moment in time when you're actually going to have some rest and that you feel safe. Manual, of course, runs counter to that because what's happening in people's minds in the 1950s is the fact that we're not safe and we don't know whether we're going to wake up in the morning or not. What I think is particularly chilling about all of that is that there was some evidence that he returned to the house after killing the smarts, uh, fed the cats and indeed made it some kind of a base because there was some evidence that he ate in the house and uh, the, the whole thing actually beggars belief. Hey, puss. Look what Peter's got for you. Look at this, eh? Look at this, eh? Look at that. Oh! <laughs> it didn't bother him in the slightest that uh, next door was a ten-year-old boy whose life had just been stopped dead. The next door was a husband and wife who had been shot through the head as he lay in bed after celebrating the New Year. This meant nothing to him. You can have various elements to a psychopathic personality. There's indifference, 
to people's uh, feelings, manipulation, lying, numerous other factors. There's supposed to be about you know, 30, 40 different things. But from the forensic uh, psychiatrist that I've spoken to, what's really fascinating about manual is manual ticks every box. Was Peter Manuel insane? Was he fit to stand trial for his appalling crimes? And can he ever be defined? It's a story that reads like an American gangster movie script. And indeed, even though he was raised in Lanarkshire, the Manuel story begins in the US. Peter Thomas Anthony Manuel was born in New York on the 15th of March, 1927. His Scottish parents were seeking better prospects and an older son had been temporarily left behind. The endeavour failed and the family returned to Britain. When their Coventry home was blitzed during the war, they moved to the Lanarkshire village of Birkinshaw. I think the crucial things are that he comes back to Scotland when he's five years old. And there's a double displacement there. Firstly, he's torn out of New York or America, whichever part of America he was in. And then he suddenly finds he's also displaced as an only child because he gets back and finds he's got a big brother, James, um, who's a few years older than he is. Now, we don't know how much he knew about James's existence before he came back, but it must have been a considerable shock. A third child was born, a sister. As the middle sibling, Peter Manuel was frequently in trouble and with spells in and out of approved schools, his behaviour rapidly worsened, from frequent thieving to random acts of violence. The classic tale told of him as a boy, I think he was about 15, he was, wasn't was old enough at the time for Borstal, he was in a remand home somewhere, he was always escaping, he made a record, I think, as an escaper, and uh, he turned up in some girl's bedroom, a night, night shift worker, and she awoke to find this boy battering her over the head with a hammer. So this early event, this hitting of a slumbering woman over the head with a hammer, is, to my mind, a chilling precursor of things to come. After the war, a criminal lifestyle took hold, culminating in three serious sexual assaults. The last of these, a rape, resulted in Manuel being sentenced to eight years in Peterhead Prison. He was released in October 1952 and quickly returned to crime. He was marked out as an habitual offender with a reputation for arrogance and a tendency to boast of his crimes. In 1956, Peter Manuel embarked on a killing spree that terrorised Glasgow, Lanarkshire and eventually the country at large. In 1956, East Kilbride was just beginning its transition from rural village to suburban new town. May McLaughlin lived at Capelrig Farm, soon to be devoured by the development. May and her sisters were friends with young neighbour Anne Neelands. It was New Year 1956. Anne came in looking for my older sisters to see if they would like to go out. Anne just decided to stay for a wee while. Her dad didn't allow her to wear makeup, so she always put it on when she came into her house. She put her makeup on and decided just she wouldn't wait for my sister, she just decided to go down to the village. And that was the last we heard of her. Anne Neelands attended a dance in nearby Blantyre. Police later concluded she had been walking home alone after midnight when she must have encountered Peter Manuel. Horribly killed, chased, frightened, struck around the head. Certainly a ferocious attack and blood and bone and brain matters spattered a long way. She'd been hit over the head with a very heavy blunt object which had actually caved in the top of her skull. You know, it wasn't just a, a killing, it was attacking someone's face, someone's head, someone's personality, I suppose.
It appeared that 17-year-old Anne had run for her life. On the 4th of January, her body was discovered in Calderwood Estate, where there was a golf course at the time. The brutal killing of a teenager horrified what was then a tight-knit community. She was lovely. She was always smiling. Really, really full of fun. And when this happened, we just, we were all devastated, we just could not believe it. The police found one of Anne's shoes near the McLaughlin's home, strengthening their theory that she had been chased. That hurt terribly. We were so upset because we thought, was she running, running towards our house for help? And nobody heard her. East Kilbride teenager Anne Neelands was murdered at New Year 1956. Peter Manuel was working in the area at the time for the gas board and because of his lengthy criminal record was very quickly questioned by the police. He was not, however, detained. And when they went to see him, his face was badly scratched. Now, he claimed those scratches were obtained in a street fight in Glasgow uh, during a holiday period and, you know, that's quite possible, I suppose, but it, it's interesting to to think that nowadays DNA would easily, I imagine, have established he sustained the scratches from Anne Neelands. Never shy to talk, Manuel also spoke to the press about items he described as stolen from the gas board workers' hut near the scene of Anne's murder. We heard about this guy who's a worky and he had said that there was a pair of Wellington boots and a picture had been stolen. So we said, we must have a look at this guy. So the reporters were chatting away to him, and I thought, I have to get a picture of this guy, because this sounds quite good. And I put the camera to take his picture. He said, no pictures. Absolutely, categorically, no pictures. So that is like a, a red flag to a bull. You know, we, as photographers, we must get our picture. I thought it was quite... A handsome-looking wee chap. You know, he was short in stature, but the one thing that I always remember was his dark, dark eyes, his black eyes, you know, staring at you. And <laughs> Not a nice feeling when you get stared at like that with these eyes. That is when the hairs on the back of my neck started to go up a wee bit. That's when I thought, oh, maybe this guy was serious. But despite all the suspicions levelled at Manuel, he was never charged because he was given an alibi for the night that 17-year-old Anne was battered to death. His father gave him an alibi, said he was at home, and it's strongly suggested that his father did destroy blood-stained clothing that his son was wearing at the time. In certain defined circumstances, murder was still a capital offence in Britain. A convicted killer would hang unless the outcome was a verdict of diminished responsibility. But then, as now, psychopathy cannot form the basis for such a plea under Scots law. No one was arrested for Anne Neelan's murder and Manuel remained at large. The next atrocity took place on the 17th of September 1956 in the quiet, middle-class suburb of High Burnside, where the Watt family lived. Vivian Watt was 16 years old. On the Sunday night, Vivian and a friend of hers had gone out to a um, window shop around the city, Glasgow and had returned home. The friend had gone back to her house later in the evening, leaving Vivian at home listening to Radio Luxembourg with her mother and her mother's sister in the same house.
her room was in turmoil. Her clothing had been removed, torn off her, and her body was showed signs of physical violence before she had been shot through the head. Mrs. Watt was uh, sharing a bed with her sister, Mrs. Brown. They were both shot through the head. Vivian was alive when Manuel left the house but died shortly after the alarm was raised the following morning. You have to remember at this time there were only on average about 14 murders a year in Scotland. So finding a family of three people killed in one night in their own home, most secure, safe, place has a tremendous impact. The police quickly arrested a suspect, William Watt, the husband, father and brother-in-law of the three murder victims. Watt had been away on a fishing trip in the Loch Gilphead area when the shootings took place. He was a successful local businessman and was rumoured to be a womaniser, no more. But among the police investigating the latest horror, there was the belief that he could have driven south through the night, slaughtered his family, and then driven back to the hotel to continue his break. William Watt was charged with the murders and sent to Berlini prison on remand. Coincidentally, a few days later, Peter Manuel was also sentenced for a colliery break-in. Perhaps police still did not believe that a loudmouth Lanarkshire crook really did have the capacity for full-blown murder. But he was unable to conceal an overwhelming need for attention, as his psychopathic character became more and more apparent to those who did have contact with him. He found himself in Barlini prison and found that the star prisoner in Barlini was, of course, William Watt. Manuel, of course, found himself being eclipsed by... Watt's presence, and this was not the sort of thing that he would take lightly. Manuel then made direct contact with the Watt camp through renowned Glasgow solicitor Lawrence Dowdell, who was defending William Watt. He told Dowdell he had information about the murders as yet undisclosed to the public. He had a reputation, actually, for writing to Lanarkshire police and uh, telling them about all, thing, all sorts of things that were going on in Lanarkshire and naming names and telling them who did it and sometimes describing things that he had done. Uh, there's no doubt that he, he loved the limelight. He, he liked the idea of being the centre of attention. So he writes to Lawrence Dowdle, the solicitor, and says, you know, I can tell you a lot more about this case. And he pushes himself again into the limelight. And he tells Dowdle all sorts of things about the house that Dowdle and everyone else thinks he couldn't have picked up from another party, although Manuel says, I've been told this by the guy who actually did the killings. Put your hands above your head. If I find what I'm looking for, Spade, you're dead man. <laughs> Manuel made much play of his American ancestry and he avidly read American gangster novels. He read, he watched gangster movies. He would dress in pinstripe suits and he would speak with an American accent. After Watt had been released from prison, um, he embarked upon a one-man quest to try and find his, the killer of his wife and child. And he had gone to the Glasgow underworld to see if there was any information as to where the gun had come from. He had gone into various pubs which were frequented by the 
hoodlums and the ne'er do wells of Glasgow underworld. Almost as soon as Manuel himself was freed from Barlini at the end of November 1957, a bizarre meeting was arranged between him and William Watt. In this William Watt, his family had been murdered. He's been accused of the murders. He sat in prison. Public opinion was convinced he had done it. And in those days, people were executed. It was a very, very chilling experience for him. And here he's sitting across a table from the guy whom he is convinced has done it, has killed his family, has put him in that dreadful, life-threatening position. And this fellow is trying to charm him with his knowledge of the case. The narcissistic element of his personality came over. The, the man seemed to be really quite vain uh, in, in, in the way that he presented himself. Good looking, but a vanity and a great confidence and no sense of anxiety about him at all. Let's get this straight, man. It's money you're after, you can forget it. Secondly, if I find out that you have anything to do with the incident at my house, not only will I lay hands on you, I will tear you into tiny little pieces. Don't threaten me. People don't do that with Manuel. I'm not interested in you, you little crook. Just tell me what you know. Look, let's be clear about one thing, William. Can I call you William? Yeah. I'm not interested in money. I'm here as a friend. The more we learn about Manuel's extraordinary behaviour, the more difficult it is to understand. Some have suggested that he was suffering from a state of epilepsy, which may have contributed to a state of mind that led him to commit his crimes. In March 1958, he was examined by Dr. Gaylor, the, the distinguished neurologist at, uh, at Glasgow University. The reports produced subsequently seemed to suggest that there wasn't any evidence of classical epilepsy, but there were evidence of, of fugue states where, you know, he seemed to be kind of... Uh, go through memory loss and amnesia. Temporal lobe epilepsy would, might make him psychotic, but it would not make him a psychopath, even if it existed. And I'm afraid to say that all the medical reports that we have seen indicate that there's no sign of any epilepsy. You told me everything, William. Your wee lassie with her knickers down and the mess he made of the place. What are you there? I'm sick of it all. What are you in it too? Why? I'm only trying to help, William. I know all the worst out there. They can never keep quiet. I'm only trying to help. <sighs> Three days after Christmas 1957, 17-year-old Isabel Cook from Uddingston had a date with her boyfriend Douglas Bryden. I met Isabel Cook at school and I think it was the fourth year and uh, she and I uh, appeared to click and uh, we became very friendly. We used to uh, walk up to school together from, from the train and uh, she was a beautiful girl. Um, by common consent, she was the, the one of the top-looking girls in the school. I think you would call her a stutter nowadays. The arrangement was that I would meet her at such and such a time. It was on the main street in Uddingston, and uh, we would go together to the dance. But Isabel didn't turn up. And when she had not come home the following day, her parents reported her missing. The police found her underwear, but there was no trace of Isabel or a body. 
An extensive search took in the whole of the UK with growing fears that Isabel's killer had perhaps dumped her in a railway carriage. On the 3rd of January 1958, a young boy, David Pirrett, went to visit his friend Michael Smart. No one answered the door. My theory is that where Michael lived was the first house on the left of the road coming down from Birkinshaw, which is still an area in Uddingston. This is before they built the motorway, the M74. And I think he just decided to go into the first house he came to. David's best pal was 10-year-old Michael, who lived with his parents, Doris and Peter. He was an only child and spent a lot of time in David's company. Peter Smart was the manager of a civil engineering firm. The family had been planning to visit Doris Smart's parents in the borders for the new year, but changed their minds and stayed at home for the celebrations instead. Until David called round, neighbours assumed the Smarts had left the house as intended. After he had shot the Smarts and their young son, Manuel remained in the house. He left but returned, police reckoned on at least one occasion. He ransacked cupboards, ate the Smarts festive food and fed the family cat. <laughs> hey, where are you going? Hey, where are you going? Peter will look after you, won't he? Yes, he will. Look at that, eh? <gasps> Peter will look after you, won't he? Yes, he will. Young Michael's friend, David Pirrett, realises he probably had a very lucky escape. Well, it's, it's quite foreseeable I would have been there the night he was murdered. I think it was either the day or two days before he was, he was murdered. And I can remember being at his house and he, he was an only child, and I had two brothers. And I often used to stay the night with him, and I remember him asking me to stay the night. And I phoned my mother to get permission, and she said no, but it wasn't convenient, as far as my mother was concerned, to stay the night. I'd been to the house after the murders had taken place and noticed that the curtains were closed. I went back later one afternoon to find the curtains were now open but there was never any reply to my ringing of the bell and knocking at the door, so my assumption was that Manuel must have been in the house when I'd gone to the house the first time. Asleep, quietly, peaceably in their own beds, in their own house, and then they're killed. There's a huge sale in in uh, locks for doors and windows and the like during that period. There was a climate of real fear until Manuel was arrested. With a string of violent homicides on their patch, Lanarkshire police could no longer cope. Once it was out of control and they were seen to be getting nowhere, um, public opinion insisted, obviously the Crown Office came round to that view, and uh, Glasgow was brought in, or at least Glasgow detectives. On the 14th of January 1958, at 6.45am, they called at the Manuel household in Birkinshaw with a warrant. Searching Peter Manuel's house had become pretty par for the course. Stolen items were found, and on the strength of that, Manuel was arrested, as was his father, for theft. 
Police were now convinced Manuel was guilty of murder. He was put into a cell on the morning of the 15th of January and at first he was left there alone. Manuel's captors had a very, very bright idea of keeping Manuel entirely incommunicado. Um, they did not speak to him for many hours. He sat in the cell, just stewing away, uh, wondering why nobody was speaking to him. When he was in the cells and he wanted to speak to Inspector McNeil, McNeil, who knew him, said, just leave him. The longer you leave him, the more he'll want to talk. Eventually, it was all too much for uh, you know, the stars of the show to be ignored like this. And um, he told the police that he wished to discuss things with him. Inspector McNeil finally saw Manuel, who then wrote two letters offering to assist with clearing up some Lanarkshire crimes, on condition that he was allowed to see his parents and that his father, who was innocent, could be freed. Speak up now, son. You know what you have to tell. What have you done, Peter? Come on. You know what you have to do. Peter, please. Just tell the truth. About everything. I've been fighting this thing for years. I don't know how these things happen. I don't know what makes me do these terrible things. It's okay, Peter. It's over now. Is a psychopath who's somebody like Manuel, somebody who can't help himself? Even on the evidence that's used against him, when he goes into the police station where he's supposed to have turned around to his parents and say, I can't help doing these things. Maybe it's true. And maybe he was the kind of person who just couldn't help it. And that maybe is part of the problem with psychopathic personalities. I hereby promise to you personally that I am prepared to give information to you that will enable you to clear up a number of unsolved crimes which have occurred in the county of Lanarkshire in the past two years. This promise is given that I might release my father and my family from any obligations or loyalties they may feel on my behalf. I wish to see my parents and make a clean breast with them first. The crimes I refer to above are crimes of homicide. I further wish to stress... Peter Manuel finally confessed to eight murders, but there was still the matter of Isabel Cook. Where was her body? Again, Manuel was determined that things be done on his own terms. He goes out to try and identify the, the body, and the story is that eventually uh, he turns around to the policeman and says, I'm standing on her now. Is this another of your tricks? You're not impressing me, Manuel. I don't think you do remember. Well, whether she's here or not, we've got you anyway. It's the end of the road for you and me. It's not been for nothing, sir. Coming here? You know me, I'm just trying to keep you right. You need that, don't you? Look, if you do know where the girl is for once in your life, speak the truth. How long are you going to drag us around? You're just having a laugh. As a matter of fact, I think I'm standing on her right now. Get off her! Isabel Cook had signs of assault on her head. She had, in fact, been strangled, ultimately, by her own brassiere, and um, her underclothing had been removed. Manuel was finally off the streets. During this time, he was watched over by prison guard Norman Ironside. He was a very intelligent lad. Very bright mind, well read, uh, but was had a super ego. 
looked upon us as lesser beings, really. Felt that he was untouchable almost. He was quite convinced that he was, in the early part, that was that he was never going to be hanged for these offences. On the 12th of May 1958, Peter Manuel went to court for what was to many the British trial of the century. Enormous sums of money were bandied about by the press for anyone with a Manuel story to tell. On the seventh day, the defence team moved to have his confession made inadmissible. Ten days into the trial, Manuel dismissed his counsel and began to defend himself. The bid to disregard the confession was turned down. The key moment, I think, was when Lord Cameron decided that uh, his confession could be led in evidence. It really was his own confession with the supporting evidence that, that did for him. I mean, they had the evidence, he clearly was guilty, but his confession was dynamite. Without the detailed admission he prepared and signed, the outcome may have been different. Physical evidence was scant. Manuel had spent money which was traced to Peter Smart, a clear link to his guilt. But many believe a case would never have been built without it. As the dramatic trial unfolded with Manuel's own life now in the balance, the serial killer's bravado never waned. Justice is in your hands. Justice. Justice is in your hands. In finishing, I can only say this. Once he sacked his own counsel, uh, he cross-examines other witnesses, and it's very much sort of how QCs are supposed to talk, either in films or on television or maybe in practice. You know, I put it to you, is it not the case that? He's got all that sort of patter. In finishing, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, I can only say this. I did not. I have not murdered any of these people. I have no reason to murder any of these people. And regarding what... Regarding William Watt's motive for murdering his wife, I have even less motive than him. There is no reason why I should shoot the woman. She constituted no menace to my life. Alive or dead, she meant nothing to me. No, too harsh. Alive or dead, she made no difference to me. And I would like to point out... In more recent years, some legal commentators have questioned the trial and the ultimate verdict, citing Manuel's psychopathy as a matter that should have been more seriously taken into account. Did Manuel's mental state render him unfit to stand trial? The presiding judge, Lord Cameron, was in no doubt in his instruction to the jury, stating that Multiplication of killings is not by itself a fact indicative of weakness of mind, proof of which is essential before you can reach the conclusion that the quality of the crime should be reduced from murder to culpable homicide. He certainly uh, didn't give the impression that he was ill. He appeared to be a very intelligent man and... Uh, he certainly would have been very annoyed if you had referred to him as having a mental problem. He doesn't really want to make out, you know, that he's mad or that there may be some mental defect in him. So in many ways, actually, part of the problem is Manuel himself not allowing the evidence to ventilate. The evidence led to Manuel being convicted of seven murders. The judge instructed the jury not to convict him for the murder of Anne Neelands with insufficient evidence to back up his confession. Absolutely devastated because as far as we were concerned, he was guilty. And when we were told that the judge had directed the jury as not guilty for, every, for uh, Anne Neelands' murder, we just couldn't believe it. Every other murder, he was found guilty but that one. And that was just... I think it just finished the family off. I don't think they could, they could believe that this could happen. Bad enough 
losing her daughter, but when a judge tells them that this monster isn't guilty, it's hard to take in. It really is. Just before Lord Cameron gave his judgment, he had said that if you'd taken a different path in life, Mr Manuel, he said you could have made a very good QC. And then, of course, after the end of the trial, Lord Cameron raised the black cap to his head and said, you will hang by the neck until you're dead. Tough guy, huh? Hey, tough guy. <laughs> Come on, tough guy. <laughs> yeah, not so tough now, are you? Hey. <laughs> hey, not so tough now, are you? Hey, not He was seen by six or seven doctors. Uh, they all said he was uh, fit to stand trial. And I think that was the key thing. Is it time? breakfast of course, you know it was 8 o'clock in the morning, the pips would go on the radio and normally there's a hush, but not in Manuel's case. The hum of conversation continued on through the whole process. Manuel is buried in an unmarked grave against the west wall of Barlini Prison's D block. Is he a vindication of the death penalty when it comes to deterrence? I would have thought not, because it didn't deter him from killing, you know, seven to eight people, maybe 15. Evil. That's about the one word you could say. An evil, evil man. And I'm sure everyone was glad when he was hanged. It's a funny thing, I mean, I'm, I've been against the death penalty since I qualified as a solicitor. For many years I've been against the death penalty, but I suppose if I'm honest, when people ask me about the execution of Peter Manuel, I'm quite neutral about the subject. Discover the turning points of forensic science in brand new Crimes That Changed History, continuing tomorrow at 9. And if you missed the first part, stay tuned.